Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, on behalf of uh, Chris Palmer uh, and, uh, and Marjorie, of course, um, I'm uh, very happy, delighted, in fact, to invite you here, to welcome you here to uh, Grand Rounds. Um, and uh, the, I've been told that the code for today for those who want CE credits is 564. Um, today, we have a very special guest who is uh, uh, a mentor of mine, a longstanding mentor of mine, um, and teacher, uh, Dr. Harold Koenig. And uh, this is in honor of Spiritual Care Month. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Rossmarin, and uh, I'm the director of the Spirituality and Mental Health Program at McLean Hospital. Um, and uh, Spiritual Care Month, in, uh, in, in the, which we're, we're doing this month of October, uh, there are a number of events around the hospital, um, uh, which uh, are uh, opportunities for us to understand a little more about uh, the spiritual needs of our patients um, and uh, potentially uh, our own spiritual needs, opportunities to, to, to look into that and to, to think about it, see how it's, how it's relevant um, to, to life in general and certainly to the life of, of many people um, who are suffering with mental disorders. Um, and this is a, a highlight event, uh, certainly for me and, and for, the, for the entire hospital. Dr. Koenig is, uh, in addition to being a wonderful speaker that you'll, you'll hear from and an incredible, an incredible uh, scholar, he's on the faculty of Duke Med University Medical Center. He's a professor of psychiatry and also an associate professor of medicine. He's also the founder and the director of the University Center for Spirituality, Theology, and Health, which I believe was the first um, center looking at spirituality and health. Um, not just mental health, but physical health as well, uh, in a major re research university, a really incredible accomplishment in of itself. Um, and his academic works are uh, the number in the hundreds, 550 psych uh, uh, scientific papers, nearly 100 book chapters, and 55 books, an incredibly prolific individual. Um, but more than that, you know, Dr. Koenig's work, um, since it really is, it's uh, in the area of spirituality and religion, which has such public relevance, has actually um, been... Um, had a lot of, had a very high impact beyond the academic world, beyond the ivory tower. Um, he's actually given testimony before the US Senate, before the House of Representatives concerning um, the religious involvement in public health. Um, his work has been re recognized by the American Psychiatric Association. Um, and, uh, and of course, a good amount of media, including Dr. Oz, NBC Nightly, Today's Show, Good Morning America. So you can see his work all over if you, uh, if you, if you, ch if you check it out, if you're not already. Um, also, I'm very happy to be his co-editor on the handbook of, uh, of spirituality, religion, and mental health. He was very kind to offer me uh, an opportunity to do that. So uh, I don't know if that's your most uh, uh, important work, Dr. Koenig, but it's potentially, I think it's my most important work and having done it with you is just a, a wonderful experience. So I'm going to get out of the way and, uh, and uh, give you the opportunity to hear from um, uh, uh, one of the, if not the foremost expert in the world of, uh, of religion, spirituality, and health today, Dr. Koenig. Thank you, David, for that wonderful introduction, perhaps more than I deserve, but in any case, I'm going to go ahead now and share my screen, and we'll just, uh, we will start up right here. Can everyone see the screen? Okay, everything looks good. Okay, so I'm gonna assume that is a yes. So I'm going to speak today on, uh, on this topic of religious spirituality and mental health. Um, so first, I'll talk a little bit about the definitions of religion and spirituality, because I know that's a controversial area. Review some of the research on religion and mental health, some of the earlier and more recent. Describe a theoretical model to help to explain the effects from these studies. Talk about clinical applications, perhaps briefly, and then provide some conclusions and some further resources for those who wish to know more. So religion and spirituality, are they the same or different? So that's the big controversy now. 
Religion is unpopular, potentially divisive. Spirituality is popular, inclusive, common to all, and self-defined. Uh, through most of recorded history, uh, spirituality and religion have been considered largely the same. But during the past 30 years, with the increasing secularization, spirituality in academic settings has become separated from religion. So let's look at this. Let's look at some definitions and then some sense of the evolution of the concept of spirituality. So religion involves beliefs, practices, rituals related to the transcendent. So uh, the transcendent is that which relates to the mystical, the supernatural or God in Western religious traditions or to concepts such as ultimate truth, reality, enlightenment in Eastern traditions may involve beliefs about spirits, angels, or demons, usually involve specific beliefs about the life after death and rules to guide behavior during this life. It's often organized and practiced within a community, but it can also be practiced alone and in private, outside of any institution. Central to its definition is that religion is rooted in an established tradition that arises out of a group of people with common beliefs and practices concerning the transcendent. So while some of you might disagree a little bit on this definition, in general, most people would agree that, that this, is, this is close. This is close to a generally agreed upon definition that is generally unique. Spirituality is a popular expression, as I indicated earlier, preferred over religion. It's considered personal, something individuals define for themselves. Often free of any rules, regulations, and responsibilities associated with religion, which is one of the reasons why it has gained popularity. One can be spiritual, but not religious. In fact, a secular spirituality is often emphasized in circles where religion is in disfavor. Thus, religion is seen as non-divisive and common to all, excuse me, spirituality is seen as non-divisive and common to all, both religious and secular. So you can see why, why this is a, a, a popular term. It's especially useful in clinical settings seeing patients, doing spiritual histories. Uh, however, because of its vague and nebulous nature, it is difficult to measure and quantify. So that has been the big challenge. If everyone defines spirituality for themselves, how do you have any kind of standard definition that can be assessed, measured, and then examined in relationship to mental, physical, social, behavioral health. Okay, so here's a bit on the evolution of spirituality over time. So here's the traditional historical understanding for this, uh, for spirituality. It, it was actually a component of religion. There were the deeply religious who were called spiritual, Gandhi, Jesus, the prophet Muhammad, Moses. Um, these were deeply spiritual people whose lives revolved around their faith tradition. So it, the, and then you had all of the, the other religious people who were kind of, you know, were religious, but were, it wasn't the center of their life. And then there were secular. So this is, these three groups were pretty clear and you could measure religiosity and those with the highest scores were spiritual and those with the lowest scores were oftentimes deemed secular. You can then compare their mental health between these three groups, both the positive aspects of their mental health and the negative aspects and also their physical health. And you could see whether or not those who were more deeply religious, the spiritual, had better mental and physical health than those who were more superficially religious compared to those who were not religious at all or might call themselves secular. 
So no problem there. Now, the modern understanding of spirituality is that it has grown beyond religion. So you have the spiritual, but not religious. And then you can compare these individuals with those who are secular, neither spiritual nor religious. And you could examine their meaning, purpose, their well-being, their peace, their hope, the positive side of mental health, and the negative side. And you could see which group was doing the best in terms of mental health and also physical health. Because we know that mental health influences physical health through the, you know, the psychoneuroimmunology, the cardiovascular system, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so now we have gone one step further in the academic world. And one reason for that is because this, this group right here, the spiritual but not religious, scientists have tried desperately to measure who these individuals are who call themselves spiritual but want nothing to do with religion. So what that has done is that's created a vacuum here that has drawn in, guess what? Mental health. So now spirituality, in, in most of the measures of spirituality today in academic research, is assessed by meaning and purpose, connectedness with others, existential well-being, a sense of peace, hope. And, and so that's how spirituality is defined. So we don't have to look at the relationship between spirituality and mental health. We don't have to study that. We just define spirituality as good mental health, and, and it's solved. 100% of the time, spirituality will be associated with and will predict better mental health. 100% of the time, because you define spirituality a priori as good mental health. So that is the big dilemma. These poor secular people down here don't have a chance when you're, when you're defining spirituality as good mental health. They have to, they have to compete with the, with the concept itself. Anyway, okay, so that's, and now uh, it's actually expanded further to include everybody. And this is a great clinical model, an excellent clinical model, but of course you can't do research on it because there's no comparison group because research compares people in terms of their mental and physical health. And it looks for etiologies or causes that impact that mental health that interventions can be applied to. Okay, so some final thoughts here. In discussing the research, I'm going to mostly use the term religion, since that is what can be measured and is sufficiently distinct to avoid conceptual overlap with mental and physical health, which spirituality is overlapping with today. When measuring spirituality for research, measures should not be contaminated with positive psychological states or positive character traits. This will help to avoid defining spirituality a priori as good mental health, and then the tautological and uninterpretable associations that will otherwise result. So in clinical settings, a broadly inclusive term such as spirituality should be used and defined by patients themselves so as to maximize connection, engagement, and conversation. So spirituality is a great place to start the conversation. And that's, that's what we need to do as mental health care professionals as we take the spiritual history to learn more about what the beliefs uh, and practices of, of patients are that are, can be very important to them. Okay, so now <laughs> is religion good for mental health? Question number one. Number two, do religious beliefs increase resilience and improve psychological and social functioning? And then are the same benefits derived from being spiritual but not religious? So these are questions that, that many have and we can, we can study that objectively, systematically through research. 
Okay, so uh, this is this is the general atmosphere that has characterized the mental health field's attitude towards religion for about the last more than a hundred years. So uh, Freud called religion the universal obsessional neurosis of humanity. He said that if this view is right, it is to be supposed that turning away from religion is bound to occur with the fatal inevitability of a process of growth. If on the one hand, religion brings with it obsessional restrictions, exactly as an individual obsessional neurosis does, on the other hand, it comprises a system of wishful illusions, together with the disavowal of reality as we find in an isolated form nowhere else but amentia. Uh, amentia is a term used to describe an, a, a synonym for mental retardation. And of course, that's where the term dementia comes from. Um, so nowhere else but amentia in a state of blissful hallucinatory confusion. So that is how Freud <laughs> characterized religion, a state of blissful hallucinatory confusion. So there you go. Now, of course, Freud didn't do any systematic research or any quantitative research in coming up with his conclusions. Those conclusions were largely based on his experiences with the patients that he saw and with some negative experience, experiences that he had had as a child as his he would be engaging with his father and the ridicule that his father experienced at the hands of religious people. Okay, um, so if you want some of the sources for all of the research, I'm gonna show you um, the Handbook of Religion and Health, the third edition is coming out in the spring of 2022. This is, uh, this is kind of the magnum opus or whatever you would call it, <laughs> that it's, uh, it's 1900 pages long. It's over six, it's nearly 600,000 words. My co-authors are Tyler Vanderweel and John Petit, both at Harvard. And, um, you know, that's, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be a por an important work because it rigorously looks at the research um, very, very carefully. Okay, and here are a couple of articles too, recently published in the Journal British of Psychiatry and Advances. Let's start out here with depression. One of the most common emotional disorders in the world, particularly among those undergoing high stress situations for prolonged periods of time. So these are the kinds of patients that we see. Many have depression. Religious involvement is related to um, less depression, faster recovery from depression, and a significant response in terms when, when depression is treated using a religiously integrated intervention. So that's 272 of 444 quantitative studies, 61%. If you look at the higher quality studies, you find that that percentage actually increases. Now, there have been 6% of those 444 studies that have reported that re religious involvement is related to more depression. So here's a recent study out of the Harvard School of Public Health. This is uh, Tyler Vanderweel's team there. Uh, this is a uh, study of close to 10,000 young people, average age of 23, who were followed up to six years. Um, in, in this study, they controlled for two dozen covariates. In other words, two dozen predictors of depressive disorder, all controlled. And in fact, since they made multiple comparisons, they used the conservative bone for only correction to correct the p-values. So despite all of that, uh, younger individuals who attended religious services at least weekly 
were more than 30% less likely to develop a depressive disorder during that follow-up time. And bear in mind that, again, this is independent of two dozen demographic, psychological, social, and physical health correlates of depression. Okay, so here's a study published in 2014 by Columbia University. This is uh, led by Lisa Miller. They looked at the neuroanatomical correlates of religiosity and spirituality in those at high and low risk of depression. So this is what they found. They had earlier found that the cortices, the brain cortices, were significantly thinner among those at high risk for a major depressive disorder. High risk, meaning that their parents had a major depressive disorder. And you can see here that the red areas among those at high risk for depression, for whom religion is not very important, there are a lot of areas of reduced cortical thickness across all aspects of the brain, the lateral, the medial, but when you compare those brains to individuals for whom religion was very important, you see a lot less red. You compare these brains here, a lot less red. So what this study might suggest is that religion, religious involvement may actually affect the brain, may help to either reduce the likelihood of developing the uh, reduced cortical thickness or might help to, uh, you know, help to expand out the cortices if, if the person has in inherited these shrunken cerebral cortices. Now that it doesn't prove that because of the study design, but it is consistent with that hypothesis that religious involvement is preventative in terms of the changes in the brain that depression causes. Now let's look at suicide. You know, we know that depression causes suicide. We as healthcare professionals, that's our greatest fear that one of our patients will commit suicide. Well, if you've got a religious patient, particularly one that's involved in a religious community, you have to worry a lot less. You still have to worry, but you can worry a lot less. In uh, the 141 quantitative studies identified in this systematic review, 75% found that religious individuals had fewer negative attitudes, well, excuse me, had fewer positive attitudes towards suicide, fewer suicide attempts, and fewer completed suicides. So let's, let's look at one of these studies more recently, actually, um, this is out of the Harvard School of Public Health. Again, this was in JAMA Psychiatry, formerly called the Archives of General Psychiatry. The risk of completed suicide among 90,000 women followed for 14 years when compared to those who attended once a week or more, the rate of suicide for those who never attended was about seven times greater. And when you control for all of the risk factors for suicide, there was an 84% reduction in the likelihood of, committing, of, of completed suicide in this study. This is, again, Tyler Vanderweel's work. Uh, now here's the research from a completely different group than Harvard or Duke or, or this is, uh, this is uh, Kleiman who in 2014 analyzed the results of an 18 year prospective study from 1988 to 2006, involving a random sample of US adults over 20,000, 18 years or over. This was actually the NHANES-3 study. The NHANES-3 study is an extremely famous study uh, of cardiovascular disease um, that, uh, you know, and that, that, that is well known. So in any case, the findings here, which was a 94% reduction in the risk of completed suicide, 94% for those who attended two times per month or more, 
Um, that was the finding. And it remained significant after controlling for gender, age, size of household, previous suicide attempts, and marijuana use. So that's these are the finds from, a, again, a completely separate group than the Harvard School of Public Health. Now we're back to the Harvard School of Public Health. <laughs> this is Chen, who works with Vanderweel. This is a 16-year prospective study, the Nurses' Health Study, uh, that followed 66,000 women and looked at their deaths of despair during that 16-year follow-up. Now, by deaths of despair, I mean deaths from drugs, alcohol, or suicide. So what you see here is you see that among those attending religious services at least weekly, there is an almost 70% reduction in the hazard of dying from a death of despair. There is also a P for trend which means that there is a dose effect response in terms of the frequency of religious attendance, which argues for causality here. In other words, that uh, religious attendance may indeed prevent deaths of despair. Now this finding is, was also shown again by the same research group in 43,000 men who were followed for actually 26 years. These were healthcare professionals, dentists, pharmacists, optometrists, osteopaths, etc. And here again, you see now a 50% reduction in likelihood of dying of a death of despair, again with a P for trend. These are age adjusted models. What about anxiety and PTSD? So here is uh, of this. In the systematic review, about half of the studies showed less anxiety among the more religious. Um, about 11% showed more anxiety, most of which were cross-sectional. Uh, and of course, religion is a anxiety, excuse me. Anxiety is a powerful stimulus for religious involvement. Um, the old saying, there are no atheists in foxholes. You know, when you're being shot at by life and under a lot of stress, um, you know, that's powerful motivation to get on your knees. So of the 40 experimental studies or clinical trials, three quarters reported significant reductions in anxiety with religious or spiritual interventions. Here's a study uh, this is actually a cross-sectional study of about a little over 3,000 U.S. veterans. This was a national random sample of, of veterans, U.S. veterans. They uh, compared those with high religiosity uh, compared to those with low religiosity, where religiosity was assessed by the five-item Duke Religion Index that involves attendance at services, private religious activities, and levels of intrinsic religious commitment. So high versus low. So for lifetime PTSD, there was a more than half reduction, more than 50% reduction in likelihood of having a lifetime PTSD. There was a 50% reduction in likelihood of having a lifetime major depressive disorder. There was a about a one third reduction in the likelihood of having a lifetime alcohol use disorder. And uh, with regard to current PTSD, there was a 70% reduction and current alcohol use disorder, a uh, more than 70% reduction. Again, analyses are controlled for multiple covariates. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, alcohol use, abuse, and dependence close to 90% of studies showing less alcohol use, abuse, and dependence among those who are more religious. Now, what's, what's important about these studies, these 278 studies, is that probably 80 to 90% were among young people, young individuals whose lives are just starting out when they are developing patterns of drug and alcohol use that may affect the rest of their lives and may also affect their education and ability to complete education. Here is a, a study from, uh, this is a cross-sectional study of young adults ages 16 to 22 in Missouri. 
um, finding that alcohol onset, alcohol intoxication, regular use, heavy use, and dependence are all lower among those who are attending religious services more frequently. And those results are independent of father and mother education, income, age, presence of ADHD, ODD, CD, MDD, trauma, parenting, inconsistencies, parent-child arguments, parent divorce, existential well-being, and several other religious variables, even those were controlled for in this analysis. Illicit drug use, again, similarly, 84% less likely, 96% of best design studies, and 95% of randomized controlled trials or experimental studies using religious interventions in order to help a person with a drug addiction to recover. Here's a recent study, an 18 month prospective study of a national random sample of uh, close to 500 US adolescents who were actually a part of child protective services that involved investigation for child abuse or neglect. So these are uh, close to 500 young adolescents that are followed for 18 months. Um, again, controlling for multiple risk factors finding that for those who indicated religion was very important, there is a more than 50% reduction in likelihood of relapsing into a substance use disorder. Let's move on to the positive side of mental health. The correlations are actually stronger for the positive side of mental health than they are for the negative side. So when you're talking about well-being and happiness, close to 80% of studies um, show that religious people are, are just happier. They just experience greater life satisfaction, greater well-being. And of those 326 studies, only three, less than 1%, found lower well-being or happiness. Again, uh, this is our systematic review. Handbook of Religion and Health, second edition, um, involve only quantitative studies that have measured well being and measured religious involvement. Here is a more recent study, again, out of the Harvard School of Public Health, looking at positive affect, which is an indicator of psychological well being, positive emotions. This is uh, American Journal of Epidemiology, average age of participants were uh, up to, up to 7,400 7, participants. Average age was 15. And uh, again, analyses controlled for multiple covariates, bone ferroni, corrected p-values, everything you could imagine statistically to get rid of this association. And yet, when you compare it to those who attended religious services less than weekly, you have a doubling in the predictive ability of weekly or more frequent religious attendance to predict positive affect, increasing that, uh, that beta coefficient from 0.09 to 0.18. Meaning, purpose, hope, and optimism, other indicators, aspects of positive mental health. 93% of studies finding greater meaning and purpose 100% of the best studies, and in the most recent edition of the handbook, all of the studies, all of the studies that quantitatively, quantitatively measured meaning and purpose and religious involvement all found that a significantly positive relationship with meaning and purpose in life. Greater hope in three quarters of the studies, a greater optimism. Um, I'm going to try to speed up here because I don't want to use up all my time with, with all of these studies, but purpose in life, um, again, out of the Harvard School of Public Health, 12 year prospective study of close to 70,000 nurses. Again, a more than doubling of the regression coefficient here in terms of predicting purpose in life over this up to 12 year study. So social support, more than 80% of studies show that religious involved greater 
gives related to greater social support. Here's a study, cross-sectional study of young adults um, showing that religious activity, which was attendance, attending religious classes, Bible study groups, church activities, um, there was a significant uh, positive relationship with greater social support, as well as those who indicated that religion was important in life, also a positive relationship with greater social support. That was not out of the Harvard School of Public Health. It was out of another group. I don't know what, where that group was, but um, marital stability and satisfaction, religious involvement related to less divorce, greater satisfaction, less spousal abuse, less cheating, more likely to have an intact family with two parents in the home. Again, close to 90%, 68 of 79 quantitative studies. Again, from the second edition of the handbook. Here is more recent study out of the Harvard School of Public Health, 14-year um, prospective study of 66,000 nurses controlling for 24 sociodemographic and health correlates, including 1992 religious attendance. Here they are actually removing all of the potential benefits of religious attendance prior to the baseline interview in predicting divorce or separation. They're controlling for all of that. In addition to, you know, 24 other covariates and correcting their p-values, and what they find is a very nice reduction in risk of divorce or separation based on increasing religious attendance. Again, there is a strong P for trend suggesting a causal relationship, not proving a causal relationship, but, but, but suggesting it. And uh, so that's that. People who attend religious services together stay together. Now they may commit, they may kill their spouses, but they're still in that marriage till death do them part. Okay, so delinquency and crime, you see the same relationship it starts getting boring after a while. It is just overwhelming evidence about the connection between religion and, and virtually all aspects of mental health. 79% um, reporting inverse relationships with delinquency or crime. Of the best studies, same percentage. Uh, of the studies published between 2000 and 2010 that examined relationships between, actually it was religious involvement, not spiritual involvement, and school performance, all of them found that religious students performed better. Okay, so here's a study looking at incidents of first arrest. So this has to do with the, this is a five-year prospective study of a, a little over a thousand at-risk youth ages 12 to 17 um, in Oklahoma. Again, multiple characteristics controlled for you see about a 40% reduction in the likelihood of, uh, of being arrested for the first time among those with individual level religious assets and same effect for community level assets when compared with no religious assets. What about being spiritual but not religious? Do you get the same benefits from being spiritual but not religious? According to these studies, no, you do not. So these, these researchers followed about 8,000 medical outpatients in the United Kingdom and several countries in Europe and in South America, looking at uh, the baseline effect of spiritual or spiritual slash religious beliefs in predicting the onset of major depressive disorder during the next 12 months. So what they found was that after adjusting for confounders and mediators, those with a spiritual but not religious view, were more likely to experience a major depressive disorder during the next 12 months compared to those with a secular view. So those who are neither religious nor spiritual, they did better than those who said they were spiritual but not religious. 
And you can see the odds ratio is not a small one here, particularly in, uh, in the United Kingdom here. It's almost three times a greater risk of major depressive disorder. The same is true in a study uh, looking at uh, over 7,000 people in England. Um, again, I, I believe this is a prospective study. Um, and what they found was that those who were spiritual but not religious were more likely than those with, who were neither religious nor spiritual to have ever used or been dependent on drugs, have abnormal eating attitudes, and have generalized anxiety disorder, any phobia, or any neurotic disorder. So these individuals who were spiritual but not religious actually had more mental health problems than were those individuals who were neither religious nor spiritual. Okay, so how do we make sense of all this? We're going to focus here on religious involvement. So this is kind of a complex model that describes um, that it, the effects of religion begin in the prenatal environment. Um, so the child's brain is developing in the womb and the mother's behavior is going to influence that brain development. We know that. If a mother is drinking alcohol, using drugs, if the mother is under a high level of distress because they are having problems in marriage or if they're a single parent and they got to work and they have other kids, all of that's gonna, gonna create an environment in the womb that is going to increase the risk of that child later having problems with stress. That's well established. And if religious mothers are, if mothers are religious, they're gonna be less likely to use drugs, alcohol, they're less depressed, less anxious, possibly less stressed out, more likely to have an intact family, um, less likely to have stress in the family, so in any case, it begins in the interuterine environment. When the child arrives then, um, many religions really have a value for children. Um, they place great value on having children and uh, there, there's research showing that the actual nurturing of children once they're born uh, is affected by the religious involvement by the parents. Um, in a way that may enhance the development of, tr of trust during those that initial year, the trust versus mistrust, which may be crucial later on for, for relationship development and, and mental health. Also, as the child grows up, as they're approaching their teenage years, research shows that religious parents are more likely to monitor the child and keep them out of trouble by more careful monitoring. So religious youth, again, the research shows that they're less likely to get into trouble, less likely to use drugs, less likely to get pregnant in teenage years, all of that's less. And part of that has to do with religious parents having, being more likely to monitor uh, the child. Um, then the training that religious families tend to have more emphasis, place more emphasis on morals and values. Um, in the adult environment, then, the use of religion to help to cope with trauma and loss um, and to generate positive cognitions and healthy forms of coping. The effects of religion on social relationships in terms of generating social support, in terms of having pro-social peers, in terms of uh, volunteering for religious reasons, all of which seem to be good for your mental health are enhanced by religious involvement. Religious involvement also influences the decisions that people make, which tend to be more pro-social in nature, tend to make healthier decisions in terms of not only drug and alcohol abuse, but cigarette smoking and exercise, <laughs> and to some extent diet as well. Um, they also generate virtues and character. So in any case, religious involvement across the lifespan has impacts on mental and social health. Now we understand that, that all of these impacts are influenced by genetic factors and by gene environment interactions, particularly you know, the, the, the environment in which the child was raised, which, which has nothing to do with the person's individual choices, but may have something to do with the religion of their parents. 
So I think that, uh, so applications of mental health care, briefly, everybody needs to take a spiritual history. Talk with your patients about these issues. Respect, value, support the beliefs and practices of the patient. This has got to be patient-centered care. Identify the spiritual needs of the patient. Whatever the patient defines those spiritual needs as, ensure that someone meets those needs. Usually it's pastoral care, unless you've got training on how to meet the spiritual needs of people with mental health problems. Uh, praying with patients, a little more controversial, but if the patient requests a prayer, you know, you can say a short prayer. You can have the patient say the prayer. You can learn a lot from what the patient actually says during a prayer. It gives you some sense of what's really important to them. And then work with the faith community if the patient consents, of course, with our confidentiality requirement. Um, here's a brief spiritual history out of the Journal of the American Medical Association. Now pretty old, but these five quick questions do you have any religious or spiritual beliefs that provide comfort? Are your religious or spiritual beliefs a source of stress? Sometimes they can be a source of stress. Do you have any beliefs, religious or spiritual beliefs, that might influence your medical decision making or, or your decisions about psychotherapy or use of, of antidepressants or, or, or you know, antipsychotics or whatever? Are you a member of a faith community and, and is it supportive? Do you have any spiritual concerns that someone should address? So this is a brief spiritual history. We actually have a 15 item uh, uh, spiritual history, but uh, th that one was a brief one. So clinical applications are vast in terms of provision of mental health and pastoral care services. Encourage behavioral health providers and chaplains to take a detailed spiritual history on all of those who come for help that means basically, you know, behavioral health is psychology, sociology, psychiatry. Be alert for signs of what's called moral injury. Now, I didn't talk about that, but, you know, if you want to know more about that, uh, you know, uh, I can talk about that. But we're, I want to have some time for questions. Support the religious beliefs and practices of those who are religious and provide them with the resources necessary to practice their faith. And... Uh, for those who are not religious, support the beliefs and practices that provide meaning, purpose, optimism, and hope, and other pro-social and team-building attitudes that promote psychological resilience in high-stress situations. So for the resources, here's our monthly e-newsletter. Uh, you get it for free. Just sign up on our website. Here's Spiritual and Patient Care, a book that you can utilize to uh, learn more about how to address these issues clinically. Here is a book that describes the research, how to conduct research in this area. It basically summarizes all of the research in our summer research workshop that is being held on site in 2022. Uh, if you have any questions about that, send me an email. This is what David Rosemarin attended. So he enjoyed that, that, uh, that workshop too. And look at him today, look at him today. Here's our website, and let's open it up for questions uh, over the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Hi, Dr. Koenig. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, really enlightening presentation. You're always uh, uh, really up to date with the, the, latest, uh, the latest research in this area. Um, okay, so a number of questions have come in, and I'm going to be moderating it. Um, there's one that was typed in the chat, and I think I'll go for that one first. Um, which is that of studies of religiosity, um, the effects of uh, the effects, the many of the studies that you cited, in fact, they look at frequency of attendance at worship services. That's an often a common proxy for measurement of spiritual, of, I should say, religious uh, involvement, um, given your talk. Um, so how do you parse out the generic effects of community involvement, as opposed to the religious involvement in particular? How do we know that if I may paraphrase, how do we know that it's a God effect? Why can't it just be a community effect, which happens to be occurring in a spiritual or religious context? Yeah, a great question. And that, that is what research has really tried to sort out that question of, is this just community involvement, you know, socialization? And uh, actually it's part of the mechanism, but 
it only explains about 25% of the effect that uh, religious attendance has on these, these outcomes. And in fact, virtually all of these studies, all of those odds ratios and hazard ratios are controlled for social support, usually indicating, usually including uh, multiple measures of social integration, social contacts, et cetera. And despite that, these, these effects still persist. Um, but, but the social interaction is part of the mechanism by which religion affects, affects a person's mental and, and other aspects of health. Um, but, but there are other aspects, and, and those involve, you know, those involve uh, the, the praying together, the singing together, the uh, having a common belief system together, the, the lessons one learns from listening to a sermon that helps people live their lives in a healthier way. So there are religious attendance is a package of a bunch of other things other than just social interactions. Um, very interesting. I, um, another question um, is, uh, is as follows, that spirituality and religion are multifaceted and there are many different aspects of it. Some of them have become more uh, popular, I would say in recent years including mystical experiences, the concept of having a, whatever that means, a mystical experience, and also being more meditative or contemplative, um, which in some regards comes from uh, religious roots in many cases, but often today is um, practiced uh, in devoid of actual um, theistic beliefs. So um, one of the comments here, which I've embellished a considerable amount, sorry for taking so much poetic license, is could you comment on the research about these two specific facets, mystical experiences and meditative or contemplative behaviors, which are facets of, of religion and spirituality? Yeah, you know, ex experience really is, uh, is a key aspect of people developing a deeper, more personal religious faith. So having these mystical experiences, however you characterize them, particularly when framed within a religious tradition, can be powerful, can be very powerful. Not a whole lot of research has examined that. Much more research is on, um, on meditative practices such as mindfulness. Um, and actually what many people don't know is that yes, yes, mindfulness is now a secular treatment that is used for virtually everything. Um, but, uh, and, and many recognize that, that mindfulness has its roots within Buddhism and is in fact the, I believe it's the seventh step on the eightfold path of Buddhism is mindfulness. Uh, so it, it, it has strong roots within the Buddhist tradition, but, and, and that, that's great, particularly for Buddhists and for people who have no religious faith, who may be more open to a, a Buddhist form of, of mindfulness. But many people don't recognize that there are many forms of mindfulness that are actual treatments, mindfulness meditation that are rooted within the Jewish tradition, particularly the, the Kabbalistic tradition, rooted within the Christian tradition in Lectio Divina, in uh, centering prayer and, and studies of Christian mindfulness um, in, in people showing that Christian mindfulness when, and this is a randomized controlled trials, Christian mindfulness is a, has greater effects on anxiety and depression than does secular mindfulness in Christian patients. And because most of what we're doing nowadays is supposed to be patient-centered, culturally appropriate, there, there is really a, a lot of logic for using, for identifying the religious tradition of the patient and then utilizing a, a religion-specific form of mindfulness to help that individual in their situation. And what's quite likely is that if uh, mindfulness is based upon that person's religious beliefs, that's gonna be a much more powerful motivator for them to both comply and derive benefit than if 
if it's used in a way that, that is foreign to their religious beliefs or completely secular in nature. So um, there's a lot of research, again, kind of summarizing, showing that religion-specific mindfulness may in fact be, be more helpful for individuals than just generic mindfulness that is now, as I said, used for everything. Interesting. Um, okay, so a couple of comments that just came in. They might be a, a bit of a, a, a bit of a curveball, um, but it is Boston and it's the postseason. So, um, uh, so uh, uh, one of the comments there, there are really two comments in there together. Questions, I should say, which is um, uh, one. I'll just read. I understand that religious faith correlates with many positive indicators of mental health. Nevertheless, many people like LGBTQ or divorced individuals feel estranged from previously supported re religious communities. And this causes great pain and psychological suffering. Could you please address some of these adverse effects? And uh, just to follow up that curve with a knuckle, um, that sometimes uh, patients with adverse childhood experiences have personal difficulty wanting to have a religious faith, but they don't trust in, in God because they've had bad experiences. They've had traumatic events. Um, so they really live with this, if you will, divine spiritual struggle. Um, and other people haven't been asked to bear those you know, those, uh, those difficulties in life and they have. So how do we address either communal spiritual struggles or individual spiritual struggles of a divine nature or otherwise? And I will add that, you know, uh, my research has, has borne this out that you know, spiritual struggles have pretty strong effects on suicidality and, and other aspects of, of mental health, especially in patient populations at, at McLean. So clinically, I think the questions are really clinically, how do we, as clinicians, address these sorts of issues? How do we assess for them? How do we understand them? And, and what do we do when patients come in with these struggles? I think that's the tenor of both of these questions. Okay. So, um, you know, how do you address when, when individuals come in with the spiritual struggles related to their, their, their gender or sexual orientation, um, the trauma that they may have experienced in, in a family that has interfered with their ability to trust you know, trust anyone, including the divine. How do you deal with it? So what's crucial here is that you take a spiritual history. So listening, in, in this case, in this case, listening is very, very important. Taking the time to listen to that person, explain what happened to them. How is their religious faith affected by that? How is, uh, what, what negative experiences have they had in this regard? Let them talk and let's see, and, and, and understand, of course, accept where that person is at in that regard. Um, you know, providing explanations or defending God really doesn't help one bit, not one bit. It's, it's really about acceptance, listening, and trying to understand. If you do that, that a lot of times will help people work through a lot of these religious and spiritual struggles. There is a natural impulse to work through it. The, the problem is that some people get stuck there. They get stuck there in the religious struggle. And, and David is absolutely right. That, that devastates their mental health. And, and not only that, but their physical health. I think two, deca two decades ago, uh, Ken Pargament and, and I showed that, that those who are struggling, uh, those who with religious and spiritual struggles have greater mortality, actually, greater mortality, not only more depression and more anxiety, but, but they actually die more quickly simply because it generates so many negative emotions if they get stuck there, that it creates physiological changes, including changes in immune functioning. So this is something critical to address and it involves mostly listening and trying to understand, and, and being a friend, being a friend to that person. I, this is a lot of times, you know, kind of undercut by all of our psychological therapies and frameworks we use, but sometimes just being accepting and caring for this person has enormous benefits, especially in this area. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, we are unfortunately out of time because um, there's so much more to learn from you. Uh, but I do want to thank you again for attending. Um, I mean, for presenting rather. And I want to thank everybody uh, for attending. We had a really nice uh, group this, this uh, afternoon. 
um, and for participating in the spiritual care month at, at McLean. Um, hope you'll take advantage of the other opportunities that are that are happening this month that uh, Angelica Zolfrank, our wonderful chaplain, um, has uh, is coordinating throughout the month. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.